Arachan León, Gusti Oí, Eta Ungietori. Buenas tardes a todos. Good evening and welcome. Eh, el encuentro esta tarde va a estar bilingüe. Vamos a hablar en castellano y en inglés, a traducción simultánea. Uh, for those who are watching and streaming, our event tonight will be bilingual. We'll be speaking both in English and in Spanish. Por parte del Governance, Instituto de Gobernanza Democrática, el Museo San Telmo y la Capitalidad de Cultura Donostia San Sebastián 2016, eh, tenemos el gran placer de seguir con nuestro ciclo Diálogos Europeos. Hasta el momento hemos eh, tenido ya tres sesiones con diferentes temas de las elecciones griegas, derechos humanos y comercio, eh, la igualdad, el género, y contando con ponentes de diferentes Estados miembros, de Grecia, Italia, Suecia, Holanda, la República Checa, Inglaterra, Francia, Portugal, España y el País Vasco. Y hoy tenemos el gran placer de ir al otro lado del Atlántico y llevar una ponente desde Nueva York, desde los Estados Unidos, para ver un poco la visión desde fuera de la Unión y cómo comparar dos sistemas que en un principio tienen algo similar, pero valores y historias muy distintas, que se pueda aprender de un modelo a otro, que se puede importar o exportar o no, reflexionar y compartir. En eso vamos a centrarnos esta tarde. Eh, un poco sobre el ciclo de diálogos europeos. Como se nota en el propio título, eh, se centra obviamente en la realidad europea, acercarse al ciudadano y a la ciudadana de esta ciudad, pero más que nada en el diálogo. Tenemos, el, yo creo, un gran privilegio, privilegio y honor de tener ponentes eh, de diferentes países con diferentes conocimientos y os animo, yo sé que no es siempre fácil coger el micrófono y hablar en público, pero tenéis una oportunidad esta tarde, preguntar, reflexionar, hablar con la ponente, las dos ponentes eh, con, entre nosotros en una conversación, un debate interesante. Eh, el formato hoy es, para empezar, educar, eh, escuchar, de ahí dialogar y, por final, debatir. Eh, la palabra no es la única, el único medio para dialogar. Tenemos también el dibujo, que enseguida vais a ver el ilustre trabajo de nuestro artista Ángel López de Luzuriaga, que es de Ardiluzu, eh, fundó la revista de arte Luque, y también dos blogueros eh, de invitación esta tarde con dos perfiles distintos eh, para luego reflexionar y escribir sus reflexiones y lo vamos a colgar en el blog. Cualquier persona está invitado a contribuir, eh, también a responder, eh, queremos que el debate sigue más allá que en el propio aula. Eh, los blogueros esta tarde tenemos con nosotros a Imanol Galdos, eh, que tiene una experiencia dilatada en la administración pública y en la política. Eh, sus grandes pasiones eh, siguen siendo la política internacional y la política norteamericana. Está elaborando un proyecto de investigación eh, que analiza la acción exterior vasca en relación con los Estados Unidos. Eh, también con nosotras, eh, nosotros tenemos eh, la abogada Irache Osinaga Garate, eh, que estamos todos esperando a ver qué tipo de reflexión nos van a producir. Eh, bueno, con esa introducción quiero empezar y entrar en el propio temario de hoy. Eh, vamos a ver primero la visión más europea y luego pasar a la visión norteamericana. Eh, cómo dos sistemas rescatan a sus ciudadanos o a sus empresas o hasta propias ciudades en momentos de estrés financiero, eh, porque había diferentes resultados después de la crisis económica que se puede aprender o compartir dentro de los dos sistemas, dos uniones de estados con valores tan distintos. Eh, eso es un poco lo que vamos a abordar. Eh, y para empezar, tenemos con nosotras eh, Nerea Magallón, profesora de en Derecho Internacional Privado en la Universidad de Deusto. Ha sido profesora también en la Universidad del País Vasco y en la Universidad de Santiago de Compostola. Ha trabajado en diversos proyectos de investigación eh, financiados por la Comisión Europea eh, y diferentes trabajos de investigación centrado en área de derecho de familia y sucesiones, derecho privado europeo y derecho interregional. Eh, Nerea, tienes la palabra.
Gracias, Caterina. Bueno, gracias a todos los presentes a día de hoy con este día estupendo y es primaveral en San Sebastián que es difícil encerrarnos aquí con el sol saliendo fuera. Así que os agradezco vuestra, vuestra presencia aquí. Creo que hoy es un día muy interesante y que contamos con una participación muy interesante y con una ponente especialmente eh, relevante y destacable para, para dejar el sol para otro día. Eh, un poco, por supuesto, dar las gracias siempre al Museo San Telmo a, a Globernance y a las iniciativas de CAT que nos mueve a todos, que si no llega a ser por ella estaríamos todos con 200.000 cosas sin, sin, sin ir para adelante. Y, y bueno, gracias por supuesto a, a, a nuestros alumnos y a mis alumnos de ELSA que, que nos ayudan siempre, que están también en, en todos nuestros actos apoyando y ayudando. Y bueno, yo os voy a hacer una introducción muy, muy cortita, un poco para que os sirva sobre todo para los que no sois doctos, de, de una perspectiva europea que os sirva a entender posteriormente a nuestra, a nuestra ponente americana. Eh, voy a partir un poco de lo que es el federalismo, sobre todo para comparar qué diferencias tenemos con Estados Unidos, competencialmente hablando, y por qué podemos hablar de un Estado federal como es Estados Unidos y la Unión Europea, si podríamos llegar a hablar algún día de un Estado federal o de un federalismo europeo. No sé si alguno habéis hablado, se habla de Estados Unidos de Europa. ¿no? Se, hay, hay gente que incluso ha acuñado ese término. ¿no? ¿Podría llegar a ser por qué sí, por qué no y, 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 y cómo estamos en este momento en Europa? Eh, la Unión Europea no es un, una agrupación de Estados federal, porque para eso, ahora os contaré un poco, necesitaríamos eh, ceder muchas más soberanías los Estados a la Unión de las que hemos cedido. Tendría que existir un, un poder soberana, una autoridad soberana elegida por todos los ciudadanos de la Unión, cosa que no existe. En Europa eh, nosotros tenemos una representación, la ciudadanía tiene una representación en el Parlamento Europeo, pero no tiene representación en la Comisión Europea. El presidente de la Comisión Europea no es elegido por los ciudadanos europeos y los representantes de los gobiernos europeos todavía tienen una participación que no es soberana en el sentido de eh, directa de la ciudadanía europea en Europa. O sea, desde ese punto de vista todavía nos queda mucho por, ser un, por llegar a ese federalismo al que, al que igual podremos acercarnos algún día. Eh, no existe, la diferencia más gorda aparte de esa yo creo que es que no existe una unión política. En Europa tenemos una unión económica, una unión monetaria y una libertad de eh, circulación de servicios y de trabajadores y personas. Entonces, eso implica un acercamiento hacia determinadas visiones políticas que debemos asegurar a, a, a esa defensa de determinados derechos que se acercan a derechos sociales o a derechos de carácter de ciudadano europeo, pero sin tener eh, realmente esa unión política, ¿no? esa unión política a la que Poquito a poquito yo creo que aún así nos estamos acercando. Para que veáis un poco cómo es el reparto competencial entre los Estados y las instituciones europeas, que son los que mueven Europa, eh, las competencias, hay tres tipos de competencias en la Unión Europea. Están las competencias exclusivas de las instituciones europeas, las competencias compartidas con los Estados y las competencias de apoyo, se llaman ahora. Todo esto ha cambiado con el último tratado, que es el Tratado de Funcionamiento de la Unión, eh, por si acaso que igual os suena o igual eh, lo tenéis un poco, o un poco en la cabeza o no. Eh, entonces, ¿qué pasa? Las competencias exclusivas son aquellas en las que las instituciones europeas, los Estados han cedido las competencias a las instituciones europeas y pueden realizar actos vinculantes para todos los Estados sin que eso suponga ningún tipo de, sin que se requiera, mejor dicho, ninguna autorización por parte de esos estados. Esas competencias exclusivas, que sería lo que nos asemejaría, yo creo, un poco al federalismo, para que os hagáis a la idea, realmente cuáles son. Son unión aduanera, política monetaria, política comercial común, todas las que nos llevan a tener esa unión económica, monetaria y esa libre circulación de servicios y de capitales. Todo lo relacionado con eso. Las competencias compartidas con los Estados son competencias eh, que, que implica que en esas materias los Estados pueden realizar actos vinculantes siempre que no los hayan realizado con anterioridad las instituciones europeas. Si las instituciones europeas han 
eh, elaborado algún tipo de eh, norma o algún tipo, han realizado algún tipo de acto en esas materias compartidas, automáticamente pasan a ser exclusivas de las instituciones de la Unión y los Estados dejan de poder ejercer en esas competencias. Mientras la Unión no haya ejercido ningún tipo de, 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 de actividad en, esa competen en esas competencias, los Estados tendrán posibilidad de realizar eh, actos. Entonces, ¿qué pasa? Que es, un, es una especie de, de reducto en el cual se van absorbiendo competencias exclusivas según la Unión va avanzando y va promulgando actos en ese tipo de competencias. Así, eh, en materias de esas competencias compartidas, tenemos mercado interior, medio ambiente, protección de los consumidores. Ahí ya vamos tocando de repente políticas que están más cercanos a los, a los ciudadanos. ¿no? Política de los consumidores ya nos sentimos todos un poco más reflejados con que somos consumidores. Transportes, redes transeuropeas, espacio de libertad, seguridad y justicia. Algo muy, muy, muy mmm, neutro, pero que implica muchísimas cosas. En esa competencia de espacio, libertad, seguridad y justicia eh, supone un avance hacia libertades que los ciudadanos realmente van a tener más cercano a ese ámbito político y social, que nos, a ese día a día de, de los ciudadanos europeos. Ahora os explicaré luego uniéndolo un poquito más. Y entonces estas competencias, en principio, los Estados pueden realizar actos y si no ceden la competencia a la Unión en la medida en que la Unión considere necesario realizar algún tipo de acto en ese tipo de competencias. ¿Cuándo la Unión considera necesario que tiene que hacer eso? La Unión, o las instituciones, mejor dicho, siempre tienen que respetar lo que llamamos el principio de proporcionalidad y de subsidiariedad. Pueden promulgar o realizar actos en esas materias compartidas siempre que sea necesario porque los Estados no pueden realizar el mismo tipo de acto con la misma eficacia para el mercado que si se hace desde las instituciones. Se llama el principio, eso es el principio de eh, proporcionalidad. Siempre tienen que actuar porque es en beneficio de los objetivos de la Unión, tienen que ser proporcionales las actuaciones a los beneficios de, de la Unión y siempre tienen que justificar, principio de subsidiariedad, que los Estados no son capaces de hacer lo que hacen ellos. ¿vale? Están un poco limitados por eso. En todo lo demás, la cesión de la competencia es absoluta. ¿vale? ¿Qué sucede? Que todo, todo perdón, es un poco maleable. Es ese, ese principio de proporcionalidad y ese principio de subsidiariedad muchas veces tiene una justificación determinada a la hora de dictar algún tipo de acto pues por connotaciones a veces más políticas, más económicas, más que por realmente por, por medidas proporcionales o, o, o subsidiarias reales. ¿no? Y luego están las, las competencias en materias de apoyo, que son competencias que todavía, eh, pues que a veces se, se emite algún tipo de acto desde las instituciones, a veces no. Entonces, realmente, para que eso se convirtiera en un federalismo, tendría que haber una cesión de, de las soberanías mayor. No, habría, no tendría que haber eh, tanta, tanto, realmente tanta competencia, por así decir, eh, compartida, sino que tendría que ir siendo cada vez más exclusiva, cosa que creo que está sucediendo desde el momento en que cuando la Unión coge una competencia en materia compartida, la convierte en exclusiva. ¿vale? Ahora, ya un poco como ejemplo y para unir con lo que va a decir nuestra ponente, ¿qué pasa en materia de quiebras, en materia de insolvencia, o en materia de derechos concursales, que es lo que llamamos nosotros. Eh, es muy habitual y cada vez más que en Europa se esté produciendo lo que llamamos las quiebras transfronterizas. Empresas que tienen más de una conexión con algún Estado europeo y que entran en quiebra. Los acreedores y deudores de esas empresas, ya sean como empresas o como consumidores, eh, pueden tener deudas en distintos Estados de la Unión o pueden necesitar tener que pagar sus deudas en distintos estados de la Unión o cobrar sus deudas en distintos estados de la Unión. Esos procedimientos de insolvencia transfronterizos han sido unificados por las instituciones europeas. Cuando nos encontramos con un procedimiento de quiebra de una empresa a nivel, que tiene actúa a nivel europeo, se ha unificado lo que es el procedimiento de insolvencia. ¿Qué es esto? 
el tribunal que va a llevar a cabo la quiebra de esa empresa va a ser señalado por normas europeas. Solo un tribunal, en un único procedimiento concursal, llamamos nosotros, en un único procedimiento de insolvencia, va a llevar a cabo lo que es la, eh, el proceso concursal, el proceso de quiebra de toda, esa, de toda esa empresa y todas sus deudas en todos los estados europeos y todo lo que respecte a eh, sus bienes, al pago de sus bienes en todos los estados europeos. ¿Esto cómo se ha hecho? ¿Cómo se hace que el procedimiento concursal en las empresas transfronterizas sea único a través de las materias compartidas? ¿Vale? A través de las materias compartidas. La Unión Europea ha dictado un reglamento basándose en las materias compartidas, un reglamento sobre procedimientos de insolvencia transfronterizos. Desde ese momento, esa competencia ha pasado a ser exclusiva de las instituciones europeas. ¿Cuál es la ventaja que tiene y por qué lo puede hacer? Porque quiere garantizar una serie de beneficios a los ciudadanos y a las empresas. ¿Cuáles son esos beneficios que supone que aporta que el procedimiento sea europeo y único? Pues que los acreedores cobren sus deudas a nivel europeo de una manera más fácil. Que los deudores paguen sus deudas o se sometan a procedimientos de rescate o de segunda oportunidad a nivel europeo más fácil. El reglamento sobre insolvencia, de hecho, acaba de ser modificado ahora mismo. Se publicó la aceptación en primera lectura del Parlamento en marzo del 2015. ¿Con qué objetivos ha sido modificado? Precisamente con los objetivos de rescate a pequeñas y medianas empresas. Se ha pedido un procedimiento de preinsolvencia, de tal manera que antes de que la empresa esté completamente en quiebra, se intenta realizar una operación de rescate procesal, ¿eh? procedimental. ¿vale? ¿Qué más? A los deudores a nivel eh, particular también se les va a dar una segunda oportunidad o rescate, se llama, desde el punto de vista procedimental. ¿vale? Entonces, todo eso está dirigido a esas segundas oportunidades y a permitir que pequeñas empresas y pequeños deudores consigan hacer frente a sus deudas y, por tanto, no quiebren. Se dice desde Europa, no lo he dicho yo, y además es algo lógico, que una empresa que ha quebrado, si le permites una segunda oportunidad, realmente gastas menos dinero porque ha aprendido de su error y puede volver a salir a flote que si realmente la hundes y le haces volver a empezar desde el principio. Lo mismo con los deudores. Si les permites eh, hacer un aplazamiento de sus pagos o que consigan pactar con los bancos determinados beneficios para sus quitas, pues consigues que salgan a flote. ¿Y eso qué hace? Al final, que el consumo se multiplique y que salgamos de la crisis, se supone. Si activamos el consumo de nuevo, activamos el comercio, activamos la participación de las empresas, volvemos a hacer que la confianza en acreedores y deudores incremente de nuevo el comercio, incremente de nuevo las ganas de consumir, de vender y de compartir contratando. ¿Qué sucede? Realmente, a nivel nacional, las, los derechos concursales o los derechos de insolvencia son nacionales, no están, no están cedidos a la Unión Europea. La Unión Europea lo único que ha podido hacer es armonizar el procedimiento de insolvencia, pero a nivel nacional los estados son los que tienen competencias para dictar derechos concursales nacionales. Pero habréis oído algo y de todo se va contagiando. Europa, a través de estos procesos de armonización, igual indirectos, pero, va, pero sí, pero al final directos, va entablando una serie de principios comunes que hace que los Estados se empapen de esos principios. Esos principios de rescate, de segunda oportunidad a las empresas, aunque sea a nivel procedimental, para que se puedan aplicar posteriormente las leyes estatales, algo se tiene que acomodar de las leyes estatales. Si no, no funciona. Entonces, ¿qué hace? Que las leyes estatales indirectamente vayan acomodándose a esos principios generales. Se ha abierto, de hecho, una ley española, no no, sin ser controvertida, sobre segunda oportunidad a pequeñas empresas y a deudores que precisamente eh, mana de esos principios de rescate a pequeñas empresas y de esos principios de facilitar el pago de las deudas a pequeños deudores. Eh, con más o menos crítica en la que no vamos a entrar, 
Entonces, como veis, la competencia en materia de ley de segunda oportunidad es del Estado, en este caso del Estado español. Pero, sin embargo, sin querer, al haber habido ya una armonización, aunque sea procedimental, y en esas empresas transfronterizas, que cada vez son más habituales que sean todas, ¿por qué? Porque en el mercado interior y en el mercado económico único las empresas cada vez están más acostumbradas a salir y a comerciar entre ellas, pues ha hecho que se empapen los ordenamientos estatales de esos principios que van, por un lado, marcando Europa lentamente, pero a la vez de manera firme. ¿vale? Entonces, no existe ese reparto competencial que permite hablar de federalismo, pero sí en determinadas materias, por ejemplo esta, se está avanzando hacia principios comunes en Europa, que hace que los ordenamientos nacionales deban eh, equiparar unos principios y por lo menos tener un proyecto común en materia, por ejemplo, de quiebra y de eh, insolvencia. No sé, es algo complicado, que no sé si consigo contarlo de una manera lo suficientemente clara para que os hagáis una idea general y entendáis mejor a nuestra compañera que os va a hablar ya de una quiebra en toda regla y de un procedimiento muchísimo mayor que al que miramos todos, como es lo que, pasa, lo que ha pasado en Estados Unidos con los grandes procedimientos de, procesos de quiebra, pero eh, espero haberos ayudado. Así que mmm, luego si tenéis preguntas todavía podéis, podéis hacer más preguntas. Gracias por escucharme. Muchas gracias, eh, Nerea. El año pasado en nuestro ciclo, una de las preguntas, eh, uno de los temas era cómo manejar el laberinto europeo. Y yo creo que bien sabemos que la estructura europea es complicada, como dices, maleable. Eh, en otro ponente en el ciclo le hemos preguntado al, al ex comisario Antonio Vitorino eh, cuáles son los límites de la competencia de las instituciones europeas. Y honestamente dice que no hay. Eh, no están marcadas. Entonces, ¿a ¿Dónde puede llegar Europa? Está por ver. Obviamente, con un proceso de cesación de soberanía de los Estados miembros, que no es un sistema tan fácil, pero, pero lo que es muy interesante, lo que creo que cabe bien en el debate hoy, es que esas limitaciones son basadas más en un concepto ¿no? de proporcionalidad. En gran contraste, Estados Unidos, que Washington tiene toda la fama de ser una superpotencia, sus competencias dentro del marco eh, doméstico son muy limitadas, están enumeradas en la Constitución y no pueden ir más allá. En gran contraste, Europa no tiene Constitución y sus competencias no están marcadas, ni enumeradas ni limitadas claramente. Eh, entonces, eso yo creo va a pintar un poco las decisiones y, y los valores, eh, no solo políticos jurídicos, pero económicos también. Eh, entonces, eh, para lo, ir al otro lado del Atlántico, eh, voy a presentar a nuestra ponente, eh, la jueza Elizabeth S. Song. Ahora voy a también pasar al inglés para que <laughs> hablo directamente a ella también. So we have with us tonight the Honorable Elizabeth S. Song. Judge Stong has served as a U.S. bankruptcy judge for the Eastern District of New York since 2003. Before entering duty as a judge, she was a litigation partner at uh, an associate at Wilkie Farr & Gallagher and Crevasse, Swain & Moore, uh, two very big law firms, for over 20 years. So she brings not only a lot of vision and experience from the bench, but also from, from litigation practice. She is a member of the Council on Foreign Relations And the council, uh, sorry, and the council and audit committee of the American Law Institute. She's also a trustee and member of the executive committee of the Practicing Law Institute, a member of the board and co-chair of the UNCITRAL Relations Committee of the International Insolvency Institute, and a member of the board of Prime Finance, an international dispute resolution organization that promotes judicial education in complex financial disputes. Uh, she uh, also chairs, uh, for 10 years, has chaired the National Conference of Bankruptcy Judges International, uh, the Judici International Judicial Relations Committee, and has trained judges in Central Europe, North Africa, the Middle East, and the Arabian Peninsula as an expert with the World Bank, the International Finance Corporation, and the U.S. Department of Commerce Commercial Law Development Program. 
Uh, she has also consulted with the Supreme Court of China and People's High Courts in Beijing and Guangzhou and has led judicial workshops in Cambodia, Brazil, and Argentina. She is also an adjunct professor at the Brooklyn Law School and St. John's University School of Law. Uh, Judge Don grew up in San Francisco, native of California. She received her undergraduate degree, magna cum laude, and her JD from Harvard University. Uh, before handing it over to her, I'd like to let you know that uh, this past February, I actually went to her courtroom and I watched her in action. And it was the first time I'd ever seen bankruptcy proceedings. So as a lawyer by training, I was expecting something very technical and economic and financial terms that I didn't understand. And I have to say, and I'm not just saying this, Judge Tong, but I was extremely impressed and it blew me away. It was the most creative process I've ever seen in my life. It was about mediating, it was about bringing people together, letting them communicate, letting them speak, giving them a chance to work out their problems. It was the most gracious and creative law practice uh, that I've seen. So uh, it was a pleasure to watch her and what she does every day, I think, is really a champion for law. So welcome, it's a pleasure and honor for us to have you here. And uh, the floor is yours. All right, well, Aratzal Deon, Eskeri Casco. Muchísimas gracias a usted por esta introducción demasiado grande. I think I should just say thank you and leave, because after that, I cannot help but be a disappointment to you. Um, I hope you're as lucky as I am to love what you do. And sometimes when you love what you do, it helps you have a good day, like when Katerina visited our court. Um, I'm a United States bankruptcy judge in the Eastern District of New York. Who's been to New York? It's not nearly as pretty as your city, and the weather is much worse, but you should visit anyway. And when you do, come see our court. It's in Brooklyn. Yes, Brooklyn. Brooklyn is cool. Now, it is not as cool as Donostia, but it is still pretty cool. And that is despite the fact that I live and work there. Um, it has become cool recently. Um, our court is a second chance kind of place, and I'll have more to say about that but that's one of the things I love about it best. I think when I first became a lawyer, hace 20 años, 20 years ago, it never occurred to me that a court might be a place where you went for a second chance, for an opportunity. A court was where you went to win or lose, or try to avoid losing. I mostly represented big companies that had been sued, and we tried to solve the problems. But the great insight I see over 12 years now in our court, the bankruptcy court, um, is that really, like the tide in the bay that went way out last night and the beach became even bigger and then came in this morning and the boats all rose. Did you notice that? The tide comes in, the boats all rise in our court. Nobody should be better off until everybody is better off. Nobody wins until everybody wins at least a little. That's an unusual philosophy for a court, you might think, but it's a very practical philosophy for restructuring a business because the perspective of our system, legally and, and practically, is that if through a collective proceeding that feels a lot like this, where everyone with an interest of any type, an interest in economic interest, an interest in intellectual interest, every stakeholder, como se dice stakeholder, every participant um, is brought in under a single big tent that is the bankruptcy case. And we start from there and we move forward to preserve the value in a transparent way, according to law, of course. We do not make it up. This is a court. It's a courtroom, not a conference room. But often in the courtroom, we can complement what can happen in the conference room. 
often in the courtroom at a certain point in a business restructuring, and it can be in the smallest business, the micro enterprise, and it can be in the biggest case filed in the country, which two years ago was filed in our court and assigned to me randomly, it happens randomly, uh, $7 billion case, the company successfully reorganized through a combination, if you will, of the boardroom and the conference room and the courtroom, we can have transparency, we can respond to the needs of each and all of the parties, we can apply the law, and we can confirm a plan of reorganization under the Spanish law concurso, under which, if it's confirmed, it must be that every participant from the most senior privileged creditor to the smallest credit, the smallest trade creditor, the employee with the claim, even equity, the owners of the shares, each and all of them must be better off under that plan than they were even a little better off than they would be if there was just a liquidation. Shut it down, sell it off, which is kind of the old view of what happens in a bankruptcy, in a quiebras, in a bancarrota. That's not what we mean when we say bankruptcy in our system. It means every opportunity, including in, the, in perhaps when the system functions at its best, when that rising tide raises all boats, in a restructuring that through the court process and ending with a court order, which is a pretty good way to end, a federal court order in our system is a pretty strong thing, um, each and all of the participants going forward is better off than they would have been any other way. That is a, that's a challenge. It, it's an opportunity. I think it's a promise of our bankruptcy system and I think it goes all the way back to the roots of our system. And, I'll, and, and let me get to those in just a moment. But from the, from the 100,000 foot, this morning I went to the top of your mountain and I saw the view of the ocean and the view of the town. From that perspective, that's, those are the goals of our system. That's how it works at its best. And it's actually really how it works. So courtroom, conference room, boardroom, rising tide, um, problem solving. Think problem solving court, that's kind of what we try to do. Now where does our bankruptcy law come from? Where does our bankruptcy system come from? Sometimes I think people assume that maybe in the 1950s or 60s as our modern economy, our modern global economy began to emerge, we, we discerned that it would be useful to have this kind of a federal law way before then. Um, this is the Constitution of the United States. I actually always have it with me. I don't even think about it. I bring it in my bag. That's why it's a little beat up. There are coffee stains on this Constitution. Um, but that's okay. It's pretty durable. Hopefully it can stay in the strain. Um, Article 1, Section 8 of the United States Constitution says there will be, when I talk to kids sometimes, I say this was a homework assignment to Congress. The founders of our country said there will be a uniform law respecting bankruptcy. Bankruptcy, the word bankruptcy is in the United States Constitution. I predict you could win trivia contests with that fact in the United States. I don't know many lawyers that necessarily know that. But here's the point. This was a second chance country. This was a bunch of ragtag immigrants starting from scratch, trying to build something. And part of what they write into the Constitution is there will be a bankruptcy law. So you know what? You want to start a business? You want to take a risk? And maybe it doesn't work out because often it does, but sometimes it doesn't. Your creditors, we want, we want a law that will provide that your creditors can't lock you up until you pay them back. We will not have a penal system of the enforcement of debt. Although there were some periods where some states 
may have had relatively um, uh, onerous debt collection procedures at the level of the Constitution, at the level of the system, there will be a bankruptcy law so that you can try and fail and get back up on your feet. You can have a second chance. So we are giving this assignment to Congress, to Congress. You will write a uniform law respecting bankruptcy. Now you heard some very thoughtful points about the competence and the assignment of tasks and of jurisdiction within the European Union. Um, think of it this way. The founders were not taking the risk that one state might adopt a bankruptcy law, but another might not. And so there will be a uniform federal law, says the Constitution, respecting bankruptcy in the United States. Now, when I was thinking about becoming a bankruptcy judge, because I was a lawyer for 20 years, I've still been a lawyer for a lot longer than I've been a judge. It's a characteristic of our system that people are generally in practice for 20 to 30 years before they go on the bench. Um, this would make my daughter smile. She would disagree. I was a relatively young judge when I first went on the bench. I'd like to think I still am. Um, but, but here's the point. There are actually two parts to the promise in Article 1. The, I think it's the second chance clause. I don't think anyone in history but me has said that. But the clause that says there will be a bankruptcy law also makes this promise makes this promise, there will be a naturalization law, a federal law of naturalization in the United States. Now, what does that mean? That means that just like the founders wanted to start a country where you could get a second chance if you failed economically and you needed it, um, and you were honest, what the Supreme Court has called the honest but unfortunate debtor, this would also be a country, the promise is, or you can come from somewhere else and you can be just as American, just as much a part of this country as the person who's born here, like me. I, mean, I became a citizen the easy way. I was born in the United States. But in our district in Brooklyn, by the way, hundreds of people a month are naturalized as the newest citizens of the United States. So fresh start country, fresh start economy, second chance opportunity through a bankruptcy, second chance to adopt a new country, and of course bring your country and your traditions with you. When I naturalize new citizens, I like to say, my country is now our country, but your traditions that you bring with you from 20, 30, 40 different countries, every time we do a naturalization, they are now part of our country too. We are all richer for them. So the roots of the system Constitution, the bankruptcy clause, the promise that this will be a uniform federal law, part of our law, part of who we are. Um, how does that work now? How does that work in 2015? Well, let me give you some practical context about what I see every day and what my colleagues, the 350 or so federal bankruptcy judges, see around the country in our courtrooms and in our courthouses. There's a fair amount of bankruptcy going on these days. Every year for the last several years, going back I think at least as long as I've been on the bench, there have been mas o menos, more or less, about a million bankruptcy cases a year. If, if we were, if this, if, this, if this was in Brooklyn, and I said, we'll ask you the question, how many of you know someone who has filed or been affected by a bankruptcy case? Raise your hand. Okay, well, one. Um, a million cases a year. Um, if we were in the United States, the odds would be pretty good that someone in this room, and probably more than one person, would know someone, a parent, a child, a neighbor, a teacher, a friend, a colleague, a coworker who had filed a bankruptcy case. If not this year, then maybe last year or the year before. When I travel, I will sometimes use my great big judicial ID because it's an easy thing to get out of my bag for my identification when I check in. Often, the person with whom I'm checking in will say, oh, bankruptcy, I did that. Bankruptcy, my mom did that. Um, 
a million cases a year, every year. We're a country of about 300 million people. You can do the math. Over 10 years, that means one in 30, more or less, más o menos. It's a lot more than 30 people in this room. Gives you a sense. This is something that happens. It's not something you look forward to. It is not something you plan on. Um, it's not something you're probably stopping to brag to your neighbor about, like you might brag that your child was accepted to the college of their choice. But it happens, a million cases a year. Most of those cases are not the big corporate cases that you see in the newspaper. And they're not the cases of the big cities or the small cities like Detroit that get so much attention and deserve a lot of attention because these cases are important. And they give us things to think about today and they give us things to think about looking forward. Most of this one million or so cases every year are the cases of ordinary people to whom an extraordinary thing happened. And if I ask you this question, and if you reflect for a moment, I bet you will raise your hand. Do you know or know of someone to whom something happened? They lost their job, they lost their overtime. Their child or their parent needed medical help they didn't expect. A tree fell on their house or their car. Um, something happened that cost them more than they expected. And they got behind and they needed help. I, I, unless you're the luckiest people in Europe, I predict, or you know no people, I predict you know someone to whom that happened. Those are bankruptcy debtors. Those are people who probably should think about a bankruptcy case. People will get behind in their debts, and no matter how hard they shovel that sand, the tide is coming in. They can't manage. Um, so, for example, last year, 940,000 cases, I said a million more or less, most of those cases, all but 27,000 were the cases of natural persons. 27,000 or so were business cases. Of those business cases, about 6,000 were reorganization cases. Those are the cases with the rising tide, where through a restructuring, through a plan in the courtroom, in the boardroom, in the conference room, things worked out so that the going concern value, the enterprise value, the things that makes a business different than the desks and the chairs and the computers and the paper, if anyone uses paper anymore besides me, um, that's what makes a business different and special. In those cases, the goal was to preserve that. Now, there's lots of ways it's preserved. It can be preserved through restructuring a balance sheet. It can be preserved through a process that in some laws not written in English, for example, I believe the Argentine law uses the phrase cram down, le cram down, a cram down, to say it in very American English. Sometimes things happen that are imposed by the court after a trial based on a record and applying, of course, the applicable legal standard. We don't make it up. We follow the law. But most of the time in a Chapter 11 case, and a reorganization is a Chapter 11, our bankruptcy code is made of chapters, um, it may start contested, but as a practical matter, it winds up consensual through a process in which everybody has a little something to gain if they give a little something. And what's maybe of the greatest value to you is something that you don't care so much about. Um, things get worked out. Deals get done. Opportunities are identified within and through and near and ultimately as part of the court process. Um, some of the most satisfying and some of the hardest days I have in the courtroom are days where that is a piece of the picture. And my job, while never straying from the job and the role of neutral and judge, is also to look for and help the parties see those opportunities. And at a minimum, not block them, not get in the way of them, and ideally do what a person in a robe at a bench perhaps has an ability to do uniquely in that setting, which is to, to pose the question in words or substance, have you thought about this? Have you considered whether there is an opportunity to work this out in a different way? It's just a question. You don't have to 
yes or no is a sufficient answer. In fact, don't answer the question, but we're going to take a break in this hearing. You know, we've had a long hearing so far. We've covered a lot of issues. You all know a lot more now than you did before about where the problems and the opportunities are in this company. Um, we're going to take a five-minute break, and we may take a five-hour break if you need five hours. In fact, if you want to work here the rest of this happened, that we've, we've gone back and forth and back and forth to, to move a process like that. Um, in the Chapter 11 process, that kind of case management can sometimes be one of the best, most effective tools a court has. It can be something that, again, a judge more than the lawyers or in a different way than the lawyers can start. No, I can't, I can't do the deal and I can't require a deal. But I can try very hard to make all the decisions that need to be made to clarify things, to provide for the exchange of information in what is a very public and transparent process that maybe also permits that to go ahead in those 6,000 or so corporate reorganization cases that are filed in our 350 bankruptcy courtrooms around the country, although I have to say a fair number of them do get filed in New York. Uh, so that's one tool we have. What are the other tools that we have in this process? The one that is used the most, also called a chapter, of course, because our Title 11, our bankruptcy code, is, is comprised of chapters, is Chapter 7. Chapter 7 is a liquidation chapter. When I describe it to my students in my consumer bankruptcy class, I sometimes get up and draw two buckets. Can I just, let's see if I can make these pens work. Um, and I'll say, imagine this. What time is it right now? It's 10 to 8. It's 7.49 p.m. So that means it's 1.49 p.m. in New York. Imagine that right now, it's probably happening, someone's filing a bankruptcy case if it's in chapter seven, here's what happens. At this moment, two buckets. He draws well, I draw poorly. <laughs> two buckets. In the first one, assets. Everything that debtor has, all their money, their house, their cars, except in New York, not so much. People don't have cars. I think here, not so much. People don't have cars because you can walk and ride everywhere. Um, it all goes in. In this, their liabilities, everything they owe, medical bills, credit card bills, the mortgage, hypotheca on their house. Um, at the moment that case is filed, imagine you ring a bell. Well, a trustee is appointed, a judge's appointment. Let's say you're the trustee and I'm the judge. The trustee is kind of an entrepreneur. The trustee gets to work. The trustee gets a percentage. And so the trustee is looking for assets to put in this bucket of this chapter seven debtor. Hundreds of thousands a year of chapter seven debtors. And of course, there's the liabilities. The creditors can file the proofs of claim. They can say, here's how much he owes me. Here's how much he owes me. Um, but you know what usually happens in those cases? There are no assets. Or if there are, they're the kind that are protected by state and federal laws from creditors. Because you know your creditor can't come into your house and take every single thing and leave it empty. The law protects some things. These are called your exemptions. So those, those things maybe come out. Your clothes. Your basic necessities of daily life and those for your children. Um, if you have very fancy jewelry, you have very fancy jewelry, you're probably not my bankruptcy debtor. If you have a big bank account, again, you're probably not my bankruptcy debtor. But if you are, the trustee will be talking to you about that. If it's not a retirement account that's protected by the law. So the trustee fills this up as much as they can, does research, interviews under oath, the debtor, and then either administers the assets if there are assets, or more likely files with the court, the judge, a statement saying, I've looked really hard, I've done my job, there are no assets, this is a no asset case, the debtor has, the debtor should receive, the debtor has earned, in effect, a discharge. What happens to this debt? Well, some kinds of debt, nothing changes. Last year's taxes, child support, most student loans, 
Those, aren't dis- those are not discharged. But most debt that brings people to the bankruptcy process, the credit card debt you ran up because for a year you were sure you were going to get a job next month. You knew it. You were sure that the additional expenses you have for the medical expenses of your child, you knew that you were going to get those paid off. Or actually, I don't know if this happens in Spain. I know this happens in the States. Your credit card company mailed you some checks that you could use that actually were just a way to charge more money on your credit card, but to pay a bill. And you know what you did? You used that to pay your insurance premiums on your car and for your medical insurance because you can't let that lapse or you'll lose the ability to drive the car. So some liabilities are not touched, but most, most of the ones that pushed you into the process, they're discharged. They can't be collected from you. Not ever. I explained this once to a delegation of judges from a country with a comparatively harsh debt collection law, and the judges said, so, in a year, can they collect them? And I said, no. And they said, okay, in two years, can they collect them? I said, no. I said, well, if the person then gets a really good job and makes a lot of money, then can they collect them? And I said, well, he can, or he, she can pay them. You can always pay it. There's no law against paying it. But the answer is no. Discharge means discharge. The Constitution was serious. A fresh start means a fresh start. So chapter 7, mostly natural persons, mostly nothing here. I should have crossed this out too. Um, but a fresh start, a discharge of your debt, the ability to go forward, the Supreme Court says, unencumbered by those obligations, which, according to the court process, you may pay, but you don't need to pay, and they can no longer be collected from you. So that's our chapter seven. I've told you a little bit about chapter 11. I want to say just a bit more about another kind of consumer or natural person bankruptcy because it gets a lot of attention and it should. And this is our chapter 13. It's kind of a hybrid. I've talked about how companies can reorganize and about how a person might file the chapter seven so they can very quickly be done, very quickly, a few months, so they can discharge the debt that is the kind of debt eligible for a discharge in a bankruptcy case. But a lot of people, when something goes wrong, the thing that they trip up over, the thing they get in trouble on, trouble, the thing they fall behind on is their mortgage, their mortgage. The, probably the bill that is most important to them after paying for the food and the table, paying the mortgage to keep the roof over their family's heads. But things happen. People lose their jobs. Maybe they miss one month or two months. and they can stay current once the problem goes away, once they get back to work, if they have the kind of job where they're only paid if they go. Um, but they can't get caught up. So how do they fix that in a bankruptcy case? Well, they don't want to file the kind of case if they have equity or value in their house, if the house is, more, is worth more than the mortgage. They're not excited about a case where all their value goes into one bucket, right? They don't want to give it to her. They don't want it to be the trustee's value. That's chapter 7. So they can file a chapter 13, and to say it very plainly, they keep their stuff. They keep their stuff. They get five years through a plan that the judge must approve, just like in chapter 11, to pay back what they got behind on their mortgage. Now you can be my mortgage bank. Um, they have five years to pay back how much they got behind. They have to get right back being current. So this is, this is hard work. You need to make a plan payment to get caught up and keep making the payments you couldn't afford to make before anyway. So, so hopefully things have begun to turn around for you and, and that's when people do file a chapter 13 case. And there's one more thing they have to do, and this is really important because it goes back to the view of the bay and the rising tide and the boats. Every other creditor that they have, they owe money to, has to be at least as well off 
as they would be in a liquidation. So what does that mean? We're back to that same good place. Everybody has to win at least a little bit. Now that's hard work. It can take several months and several hearings with me to get that plan in place. And the first one you propose may not work, but we don't give up. We identify the issues and the problems and the opportunities in a trustee with a different kind of job. Not so much an entrepreneur, but a manager. And you can tell there are personality styles that work better for one than the other, maybe. A trustee is appointed to help to, to collect those payments from the debtor and then distribute the money. And the best trustees to help the debtor with economic guidance and advice how to think about what might work for them. Where can they save a little money? Where can they um, perhaps get a contribution from a family member in order to save their home? And I'll tell you this, it works. When we confirm plans, and I had 40 of these hearings on Monday of this week, um, it's, I congratulate people and I mean it. And I wish them luck for the rest of their case and I mean that too. Because most of the surprises that come up in a family's economic life are not bonuses or sweepstakes. They're higher tuition payments than you expected. They're medical bills you didn't think you needed. There's an opportunity for your child to compete at the national level, but there's an airline ticket involved and maybe some special, you know, equipment or training or opportunity. Most Many, at least, of the surprises in life, even the good ones, tend to cost more money, not less money. But Chapter 13 means you can try to save your home. You can pay back your mortgage arrears, the money you got behind, over five years. And in our court, and in a few other courts around the country, you can do one other thing. And this is something we're, we're proud of and we've started several years ago. You can request to participate in a program that we call loss mitigation or reduction of loss. What does this mean? Well, banks lose money too when they foreclose on a house very often. This, this price they get for the foreclosure is not as good as the stream of mortgage payments that they bargained for because that sale price may not give them even enough to pay the arrears the amount that they are owed, the amount, of the, uh, the amount of the mortgage, the balance of the mortgage. And so as we saw this and as we heard from borrowers, from our debtors, and also from banks, that they were frustrated, that they would try to work out an arrangement of a modification, but the papers got lost, the communication never happened, by the time the last piece of paper was in the file, the first piece of paper was out of date, and it just wasn't working. Remember, what, remember where I work. I work in a federal court. When I sign a piece of paper, it's an order. And we've designed a program, as other courts have, and we were not the first, that we were among the first, where through an order, on request, we can direct the parties first to exchange contact information. Something as basic as that can be very helpful. So you call a person if you have a question, not press one for this and press two for that and press three for this and then you're disconnected. Um, and after the contact information, you provide the requested information to see if you qualify for a modification for a revision to your mortgage that makes sense both for the bank and for you. And if you don't, we're done. But if you do, that can be approved also in your bankruptcy case. And now what do you have? You probably have a more affordable mortgage. You may well have a mortgage with a significantly lower interest rate because the market has changed. And the bank is better off if it has a performing asset as opposed to an asset that's in default. Anyone in finance would appreciate that. And so we can't make the parties agree. We, that's never our job. But we can, we can open doors for that communication. We can facilitate it. And we can give people an opportunity to see what kind of, what kind of offer they might receive. Do they want it or not? 
Do they accept it or not? Can they do it or not? And I have to tell you, it is a lot of fun to approve a mortgage modification. It's very satisfying as a judge to see that the debtor and the bank have reached an agreement. It's good for both of them. They both win. I signed one of those orders today electronically. Um, it happens, if not daily, at least several times a week. But I also counted a success of the process when both the bank and the borrower have had an opportunity to consider that and have had a good process, a process that treats each of them with respect to exchange the kind of information that helps them make a good decision. That's good too. Courts should be in that business, I think. Courts should be in the business of promoting productive communication among parties. And when the consequence of that is saving a home and turning a non-performing asset into a performing asset on a bank's balance sheet or on a lender's balance sheet, that's a good thing. That's, that's consistent with, with this promise. That's consistent with a fresh start. Um, to me, that's just as much the part of the work of our court, the second chance court, as reorganizing the biggest global company um, or effectuating the, the efficient liquidation of a company that has concluded simply to wind up and go out of business because that's okay too. You don't have to stay out of business. But if you want to and your business is a, has a legitimate going concern value, it's a good thing to have that chance. There's, given where we are, I'll say just a couple of words about one more part of our bankruptcy code, and it relates to some of the unsatral work that Katerina referred to before, because the chapter 15 of our bankruptcy code is actually, in substance, the model law on cross-border insolvencies adopted by uns the unsatral commission, the UN Commission on International Trade Law. What does chapter 15 do? It's pretty straightforward. It provides the framework for courts and cases to be coordinated so that if there's a big Spanish insolvency case and there's assets in the United States, there's ways for the insolvency administrator for the, for the process in Spain through a related proceeding, perhaps in our court, um, to administer assets in the United States. The opportunity from the model law in our country, Chapter 15, is that it's a template that countries can adopt so the one, the next, has a similar construct, has a similar way of proceeding. When Chapter 15 was first adopted in 2005, there were few courts over the early years that had any experience with it because these cases, frankly, just didn't come up terribly often. At this point, 2015, 10 years later, I think virtually every district, every court has had experience with Chapter 15. So more and more, this is simply another tool, another very productive tool in our bankruptcy toolkit. Um, so those are some of the things we do. That's why we do them. I have to tell you, having been a litigator, a lawyer who represented companies in big disputes, either very big companies with very big problems or very poor people with equally big problems to them because there's a, a culture and a tradition of pro bono or voluntary representation as well, of course, in the bar uh, for the lawyers. Um, I loved what I did as a lawyer. I felt like I was productive, hopefully made a difference from time to time. In our court, I think the goal that we give effect to pretty much every day is making a difference for all of the parties that appear in front of us, the debtors, the creditors, the workers, the families. Um, I love being a lawyer. I never thought I could love a job this much. So those are some views from the bench, from that side of the Atlantic. Um, I, I, would, I would love your questions. I would love to hear your questions. I know we have some students here. I'm a great fan of the European Law Students Association. I have had Elsa uh, delegates to UNCITRAL in my courtroom as observers, so I look forward especially to hearing from the students. Anyway, back to you. Thank you. Thank you. 
Uh, thank you very much, Judge Stong. Oh, you can drop one down. So, uh, as you can imagine, right, bankruptcy, uh, insolvencies, restructuring procedures, fairly technical. I think you did a good job of giving us an overview. A couple things uh, to point out um, is, as, as mentioned by Judge Stong, right, this common policy, how do you handle financial distress, whether it's a person or a company or a municipality, this has always, or what, since the law was adopted, almost soon after the Constitution was adopted, uh, ever since there was uh, a law, it's been common throughout the United States and the, uh, the, the jurisdiction, right, the competence of, of one court. We're not there in Europe yet. Uh, and you can ask yourself, what consequences does that have? Uh, there is not a same insolvency law in each member state, not yet, at least. I think uh, the cross-border insolvency uh, regulation that Nadea mentioned is the first step, and for sure, there's already talks, in fact, that's been confirmed. There will be a common insolvency law, but not yet. So what does that mean? Spain, France, Germany, Italy, all in the last few years have changed their insolvency law to match the restructuring law of the United States Bankruptcy Code to bring that second chance mentality in a Europe surviving an economic crisis. Uh, and at the same time, however, uh, in 2014, the European Parliament uh, the Committee for the Internal Market did a study and showed that the stigma had such a real consequence on anyone who's been through any sort of bankruptcy proceeding in the EU to then get lending, uh, that we need to really consider the way we think and talk about financial distress. Uh, in fact, it was considered to, at least in English, to replace the word bankrupt with the word debt adjusted, to understand that everyone has a hard time from time to time. Uh, small, a, a micro, medium a company, a person, uh, a city even, can go through hard times. Uh, Another thing that was quite interesting from Judge Dong's uh, uh, intervention was who plays that role. In the United States, that's a judge. Uh, to be clear, because there's different sorts of judges, right? We have a federalist system in the United States. Uh, federal judges are not elected. It's a non-political position. Uh, they're appointed. So in theory, it's a non-political role who's supposed to bring different parties together and manage that process. So that's something we can talk about. Wh who should that person be? Uh, what sector should it be? Uh, could it be anyone else? Uh, 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 also, um, let's see what else. Uh, she spoke a lot about economic guidance and advice as part of the process, not being a punitive process, right? That uh, this can be an opportunity for finding opportunities, finding solutions. I don't know if this was surprising for you to hear. As I said, when I actually went to court and watched, I'm surprised at how solution-oriented it was it wasn't a funeral. It wasn't, oh no, I'm going to lose all my money in my house. It was the opposite. It was, let's see how we can help you. Uh, another point that uh, Judge Tong mentioned was the mortgages, which is a huge, huge concern here in the Basque Country and in Spain, of course, and in the EU. Uh, the Chapter 13, that process for uh, protecting your home, the minute you file, the bank can't take the house away. Uh, you have five years to work out a plan. It may be difficult, uh, but you can keep your home. So there's all these tools. And, and that's sort of what we want to uh, question and talk about all together today is what should those tools be? Are they legal? Are they political? Should they be financial? Who should pay part? Uh, how do we get involved? And can, should we consider the American model more seriously? Are we moving that direction anyway? Uh, are the needs and the values in Europe that different? Uh, don't we all face financial problems sometimes? So to talk about some of those and also some of those cases. Um, so I want to open it up now to the floor. Uh, a point also for those who don't want to take the microphone but ask questions. You can post your question on Twitter. I have our Twitter account here, so I'll be checking. Uh, feel free to send your question to uh, at Aroba EU Dialogues also. Um, Nerea, perhaps, or anyone who would like to ask a question or comment. Escarricasco, gracias. Thank you very much. No sé inglés. <coughs> Agradezco la conferencia de las dos ponentes. Eh, ciertamente, la marea que usted menciona es preciosa para pa mirarla en esta bahía <coughs> y en este Cantábrico donde estamos. 
Lo que pasa es que en estas mareas económicas donde vivimos, muchos barcos se caen, se hunden, solos, porque alguien los hunde. Eh, afortunadamente parece ser que en Estados Unidos la situación respecto a los problemas económicos de las personas y de las empresas se trata de manera muy distinta. Eh, en Europa se trata muy mal. Imagínense ustedes, o usted señora, eh, Stong, lo digo bien, imagínense eh, que si nos tratan a los ciudadanos europeos como nos están tratando, ¿cómo van a tratar a los que llegan en barcos en el Mediterráneo? Eh, como decía Eduardo Galeano, desgraciadamente decía, ya no va a poder decir nada más, eh, si la naturaleza fuera un banco, ya habría sido salvada. Eh, la naturaleza, en referencia incluida a las personas, las personas somos naturaleza. Eh, nada de esto es posible en esta Europa que nos están contando. Mm, eh, quien dirige Europa decidió otra cosa distinta y decidió que hubiera clases y clases distintas y diferenciadas, muy diferenciadas, mucho más diferenciadas hoy, en el 2015, que en el 2006, al inicio de la mal llamada crisis, que es otra historia. Eh, yo le quería preguntar a la profesora, si bien eh, en vez de esa federalización que pudiera hacer posible eh, generar un tronco común en el sentido de los Estados Unidos en lo que se refiere a lo que es, ha tratado el, la señora jueza aquí, eh, no, probablemente no es, no es más probable o más mm, sencillo o más posible que sea a la inversa. Es decir, en vez de una federalización nos tengamos que empezar a organizar más en, en entornos más cercanos para poder paliar este tipo de situaciones y abordar desde un punto de vista con criterios más parecidos a los que se utilizan en Estados Unidos en lo que se refiere a todo este problema de la crisis. Me pregunto yo, es decir, visto que Europa, no en esas tres modalidades que usted ha explicado, eh, la competencia es del Estado y el Estado, aunque eh, Europa orienta hacia un sentido, tampoco lo cumple porque no tiene obligación, no sería posible que en ámbitos más pequeños sí si pudiera ser posible abordar una fórmula parecida a la que se está eh, haciendo en los Estados Unidos. Gracias. Gracias por su intervención. Eh, yo quiero ser positiva y contestar de manera positiva. Yo creo que a nivel, a nivel de pequeños, mmm, este, o sea, a nivel pequeño, a nivel mmm, pues, local, a nivel, podríamos ser lo más chiquitín, ¿no? o sea, a nivel local o podríamos hablar de a nivel autonómico, o a nivel nacional, eh, las decisiones de cómo llevar a cabo las crisis no dependen de los poderes locales. Entonces, tal y como están repartidas nuestra, nuestras competencias, ya no con Europa, ¿no? a nivel un poco estatal, eh, dependemos sí o sí el funcionamiento de, de las quiebras y el funcionamiento de los procedimientos de insolvencia dependen sí o sí de cómo se dicten las normas a nivel nacional. En ese nivel nacional tenemos una representación parlamentaria en la que votamos todos y en la que en principio ojalá sirviera para cambiar las leyes hacia el lugar donde todos queremos ¿no? y hacia esas operaciones de rescate, hacia esas operaciones de segundas oportunidades para poder pagar, para poder mantener tu casa, que parece que en Estados Unidos son más, son más viables, ¿no? ojalá. Pero a nivel nacional, sin embargo, yo no he visto que se actúe así, de hecho, creo que nos han dado más pautas en ese sentido las instituciones europeas, o sea, que realmente nos han dado más eh, maneras de actuar hacia el rescate, hacia las segundas oportunidades, las instituciones europeas con este, 
reglamento que os comentaba yo de procedimientos de insolvencia con operaciones de, de preinsolvencia y de rescate que lo que nos están haciendo a nivel nacional. Entonces, realmente a través de Europa se están marcando unos principios que luego van a tener que ser respetados a nivel nacional y a nivel local. Por supuesto, siempre parece que lo más cercano es lo más acertado y porque lo que responde mejor al a, a, a ciudadano es lo que está cerquita y Europa a veces está lejos para todos y lo vemos todos lejos. Y uno de los objetivos realmente debería ser que nos acercaran lo que se hace en Europa en ese sentido ¿no? y que realmente tuviéramos claro lo que se está haciendo de positivo en Europa en ese sentido. Yo ahora mismo, tal y como está la situación, lo veo más fácil que Europa marque pautas en, eh, hacia las operaciones rescate y hacia segundas oportunidades que, que el Estado marque esas pautas. La ley de segunda oportunidad que se ha hecho en España en ese sentido, yo creo que sí que responde más a principios europeos que a principios estatales. Entonces, en ese, en ese, entonces ahí sí que creo que tenemos que mirar a Europa, no a, no a casa. Pero, bueno, opiniones miles y, y tantas como colores, ¿no? Sí, gracias. El vistazo inicial comparativo que has hecho entre Europa y Estados Unidos, oh, se podrían hablar igual de muchos aspectos, pero yo sí, si me permitís, subrayaría una pregunta que, que es ¿cuál es el papel de los medios de comunicación en Estados Unidos en cuanto al apoyo que pueden fomentar o propiciar este tipo de encuentros, este tipo de acuerdos, porque aquí, lamentablemente, el rol de los medios de comunicación, aquí lo que nos toca vivir es, es tremebundo. Parece que cuanto peor vayan las cosas, mejor. Y desde luego se subraya muy poco la necesidad del acuerdo, sino todo lo contrario. Parece que alguien pudiera disfrutar de que las cosas pues, vayan muy mal. Gracias. Thank you for that question. It's a great question. I wish I had a great answer. Um, most cases do not get much media attention. Some cases get an enormous amount of media attention for one reason or another, because it's the city of Detroit or it's a seven billion dollar company, or there's a spectacular uh, personality involved, a celebrity. Um, many celebrities have filed for natural person bankruptcy in the United States. Sometimes when bankruptcy policy questions are being debated in the political arena, or in the press, or both, I have thought. Um, I don't have a view on the politics. We are the non-political branch of government, the judiciary, in the United States federal system. We are not political. We do not do politics. On fait pas de politique. We don't do politics. Um, at the same time, I have sometimes wished that everyone could have the opportunity that Katerina had to come to court and see what actually happens. If you think too many people file for bankruptcy and they just are trying to get away with something, come and see who they are. And if you still think that, then you have an informed opinion. But please have an informed opinion. Um, as a court, I cannot be influenced by a press report if the newspaper or the reporter or the blogger liked my hearing or didn't like my hearing, that can have nothing to do with what I do. And I tend not to look at that. Um, I know from my years as a lawyer, including in newsworthy and high profile cases, that clients read the newspapers, Businesses are sensitive to their reputation, and they should be. And so it can be a part of the picture, 
from the standpoint of the people before me, the companies, the lawyers, the individuals, it really cannot affect what the judge does, should not affect what the judge does. Sometimes people will say at the beginning of the hearing, this happened in a very large case once, and we want everyone to know it's very exciting. This hearing is being live blogged by an important financial media writer. And I thought, oh my, do I do anything differently? And I thought, no, this is a public forum. It's a public place. Um, I guess my best response to your question would be that we all benefit from understanding things better. I think courts and anyone who cares about the law benefits when people understand the context of laws better. And so informed debate in the media is a good thing. But I guess I would also emphasize the informed. And I would want to be sure that media commentary is as good as it can be. But even saying that, a court must, cannot, must not be, cannot be, should never be influenced um, by a media report. That's a good question. Just a quick intervention. Uh, one thing, a point I wanted us to count on a bit earlier. So, you know, you can't be influenced by outside. And the, you mentioned this earlier that um, everyone comes under the same tent, right? Creditors and debtors and everyone all together. But the, at the same time and under the, the law itself, right, you have persons, you have companies, and then you have sometimes cities or municipalities, let's say. How does the court treat them the same or not the same, right? What is, because the procedures are a little different, right? What's the difference when, I mean, the problem the same, right? Un uh, inability to pay your debts. Uh, but if you're a person, you're a company, or you're a, a public entity, how does the process change for you? For, for in a general way, from the standpoint of appearances in court, we regularly have municipalities before us as creditors because they collect tax. And tax, the taxing entities typically have a priority position under the law. So most of the time that a city, for example, or a state is appearing in a bankruptcy courtroom, it is not because it is the debtor. It is because it is the creditor. Um, the way in which the court interacts with a party should not, it should not matter whether that party is a natural person, a corporation, a partnership, a municipality, a municipal entity, a state, or the United States, which is represented by the United States Attorney's Office. They should be treated with the greatest respect. They should be treated as well as they can possibly be treated. One of the great privileges of my job, actually, is treating people really well. It can be transformative. You would be surprised sometimes. But the chapter structures for liquidation or reorganization are somewhat different. In a Chapter 7 case, the debtor is no longer debtor in possession. That's a technical phrase. What it means is it's not their stuff anymore. It all went into that. When they filed the case, they were showing by their choice of that chapter that they were giving their non-exempt property to the trustee, if they have any, to distribute to the creditors in accordance with their legal priority. So the debtor actually, unlike the debtor's estate, to be technical, the thing that's created when they file, has that particular kind of role. Chapter 13, Chapter 11, very different. The debtor is trying to reorganize. The debtor is making a plan to move forward with the bankruptcy tools, and there are many of them. Loss mitigation, mediation sometimes, case conferencing always, 
status conferences, of course, confirmation hearings, sometimes motions and claims brought. That's what we do. That is the day in, day out. We say in Spanish, the bread and butter. That is the daily work of moving cases forward. We need to move them quickly because if the case is an opportunity, if the company has an opportunity to reorganize, if the family has a chance to get back on its feet, the sooner the better. If it takes you two years to reorganize your company that sells a product, your customers will have found other suppliers. I've had several um, small restaurants as my debtors, including some globally known franchises, and I don't want them to be dark for a day because someone will find somewhere else to buy their burger and fries. So that's part of our process too. In the chapter nine context, I did not mention this chapter previously, this is the chapter that permits a municipality, a city, a governmental entity, though not a state, not a state of the United States, New York cannot file a bankruptcy case, to file with the appropriate authorization and eligibility criteria satisfied, a reorganization kind of case that has a comparatively defined role from a decision-making perspective for the judge. With a company case, I can put that, I, I can, with a motion, that is to say with a motion, not a motion, um, convert that case to a liquidation. But you can't put a city into liquidation. There are different tools. There are less non-consensual tools. Um, and so in that way, you open the toolkit, there are some different things to work with from, for the court and for the parties. The fundamental premise of how should someone be treated as when they come to court, the answer is with the greatest respect and deference and with high expectations, by the way, you work hard to, when you come to court. Um, but there are different tools in the toolkit, and that's appropriate. Uh, we have a question from Facebook from Eded Lizaralde, uh, who's asking, in particular on this point, on municipal reorganization, these chapter nine cases. Uh, how do you create, or how, how do you negotiate uh, these renegotiation plans, these reorganization plans, and what's the role of a city government uh, in, in that process? Well, the judge might not be the expert on that subject, but in a general way, I think our experience in recent years has been that the case, when cases succeed, and I think they pretty much have, it's because the city government, all of the participants, but including the city government, get terrific advice, legal advice, business advice, maybe even media advice. I, I don't know, but I can't rule it out. Um, to move forward in the most productive way to address all of their obligations. I think uh, city managers that come in with a um, Willingness to engage, to work hard in a creative, productive process, and not just, this would be true for any debtor, to win because everyone else will lose are the managers who do the best. I think history, recent history, has shown that there are, in this enterprise, as in many others, emergency managers, experts, advisors, who, who know that process, who are experienced with the kinds of opportunities to work with neighborhoods, unions, um, all kinds of creditors, bondholders. Cities have a very complex mix, I'm sure, of um, creditors to deal with. And of course, every morning the sun rises, the kids go to school, the taxes need to be collected, the fires need to be put out, the police uh, need to have the lights on in the police stations, the work of the city doesn't stop, it doesn't go on hold because there's a case. So 
I imagine that the skill set of navigating that process benefits enormously from good practical advisors and experience. And I think once the decision is made to file a bankruptcy case, and this would be true across all chapters, something I sometimes say with reference to the Constitution, even if it's appropriate, is it's okay. This is actually, you didn't break the law by filing a bankruptcy case. In fact, you followed the law. The law permits it. It doesn't require it, but it permits it. And so it's okay. I've seen debtors from very low income wage earners to business managers appear in court as if they are truly and profoundly ashamed that they are there. And I understand their feeling the pain of not being able to live up to their obligations. But it's okay to file a bankruptcy case. And sometimes simply saying, you know, bankruptcy is in the Constitution. It's not where anyone hoped to be. But if you need it, that's why it's there. So. Uh, thank you. Uh, tenemos dos preguntas. Aquí, luego allá. Hola, Garracha León. Bueno, en castellano, ¿no? Bueno. No, yo quería indicar que aquí en el Estado español el problema no es el procedimiento concursal en sí o el procedimiento de insolvencia. El problema es que la mayoría de las personas físicas no tienen acceso a ese procedimiento concursal, porque si lo tuvieran no, no habría estas consecuencias. Es decir, ¿cuál es la diferencia básica? Que si una persona física se sometiera a un procedimiento concursal, la responsabilidad que marca el derecho civil nuestro, que es presente y futura, desaparece y se, liquida, se liquidarían todos sus bienes, pero también todas sus deudas en ese momento. ¿Qué ocurre? Que esas personas, no, porque para, para ir a un procedimiento concursal, lo mejor es la planificación previa. Y no, las, normalmente las personas naturales, naturales o físicas no planifican porque no, no entienden de esto, no tienen medios. Además, el acceso a un procedimiento concursal no es tan sencillo porque requiere de abogado y procurador y aparte requiere de ciertos recursos económicos porque el juez debe designar a un administrador concursal o a varios según el caso y también hay que tener cash para pagar esto y normalmente estas personas pues obviamente no entienden de nada y cuando llegan al momento a este momento ya es muy tarde para, para tomar cualquier procedimiento o para, para tomar cualquier acción. Entonces, ¿con qué se encuentran con nuestro ordenamiento jurídico que está en vigor? Se encuentran de que les, embar o sea, les ejecutan todo y además siguen siendo deudores ante el sistema porque según el Código Civil responden, con los, o sea, la deuda sigue viva y son responsables incluso con sus bienes futuros, es decir, que nunca van a salir de ese pozo. Si fueran, si, si fueran a un procedimiento concursal o de insolvencia serían buenas noticias porque la deuda se terminaría en ese momento, pero no ocurre así. Entonces, incluso no, no sería necesaria la reivindicación de la dación en pago, porque con ese, con ese procedimiento se, se acabaría todo. Entonces, yo eh, dentro de este ámbito te querría preguntar a ver si dentro de, eh, del, del ámbito de las personas desfavorecidas en Estados Unidos es fácil el acceso a un procedimiento de insolvencia o hay obstáculos económicos, eso por un lado. Y en segundo lugar, ya quisiera hablar de las personas jurídicas, que ya este es otro ámbito y yo creo que eh, dentro de lo que es el Estado español y el derecho mercantil español, yo creo que se les favorece y mucho porque eh, se están dando muchísimos casos de insolvencias planificadas 
previamente y muchos casos de fraude donde están dejando muchas deudas a todas las administraciones públicas, están saliendo de rositas, encima hay cláusulas de no sucesión de empresa y eh, es, o sea, hay una sucesión evidente de, de empresa, lo que han hecho es quitarse las deudas de en medio y, eh, eh, y, y en resumidas cuentas ir contra la libre con, competencia del mercado porque otras em empresas están pagando sus impuestos religiosamente o sus obligaciones con las administraciones públicas y con, el, con sus trabajadores y con el resto de ciudadanos y estas planifican de forma muy organizada un procedimiento concursal o de insolvencia. Y a ver si esto ocurre también en los Estados Unidos. Y, po y por otro lado también indicarte que dentro del Estado español también el acceso a la judicatura eh, no es político y se hace por un sistema de oposición. Nada más. To take your last point first, I have met through judicial exchanges um, several Spanish judges whom I admire greatly. You have magnificent judges and I learn much from them and I am humbled by them, so I second that. Um, is it easy to access the process for a natural person in financial difficulties? No, of course not. It's hard. It's hard work. It costs 300 something dollars to file a case. If your income is low, if it's below um, one and a half times the poverty level, the statistical poverty level, you can apply to have your fee waived. I grant those applications. I've seen debtors where they qualify for the fee waiver and I see that the fee would be a month's food budget for their family. I'm glad that the bankruptcy law permits that fee to be waived because you're right, it costs money to be broke. Um, it's easier with, it's less hard, it's never easy. It's less hard with a lawyer because a bankruptcy case requires a lot of information to be provided. You have to fill out many schedules. You have to meet obligations. You have to show up on time. You have to interact with the court sometimes, which is scary. Not for me, not anymore, but for everybody else. Um, we work as hard as we can to make the process accessible. I will sometimes say in a hearing, good morning, welcome to bankruptcy court. I'm glad you're here. And you'll see people like, she's what? I mean it. If you're here, we can get something done. If you're here, it's because there's a problem in your case, and so there's a motion, or I issued an order saying, come to court because we need to fix this problem. I use more technical language, but that's the point. Um, in our court, we have a full-time lawyer, employee, whose job it is to provide information to people who don't have lawyers. Issues sometimes come up in cases in those five-year plan cases, two or three years down the road, where the lawyer, frankly, has closed the file because the case is confirmed and we're in kind of the payoff phase, the pay the monthly payment phase. So maybe the lawyer, even a good lawyer, a responsible lawyer is not showing up. Um, so it's not easy. We work as hard as we can to make it work. We have the privilege in the federal system of a caseload that is substantial, but that still allows the time to take all the time we need with a hearing. We have a, spe we have a in our court, the ability to get interpretation in 150 languages by making a phone call to the interpretation service that's used by the Justice Department. So, If you don't understand, because you don't speak English, we can get someone to interpret so at least you know what the problem is. So what the, what the issue is that's being heard in court. So much of the problems 
that seem to come up, of the, even the lawsuits that seem to be brought, I would have said this to you as a lawyer, come from some, sometimes a gap in communication, an incomplete communication, a misunderstood communication um, that led to something, that led to something, that led to something. So no, it's not easy. But there are things we can do, and I think as a court, it's part of our job to try to do, to be sure that if the case can succeed, it has an opportunity to succeed. We have panels of volunteer lawyers that we can refer people to. Again, I did that on Monday. I did it on Tuesday. Um, if, if someone is, is, to me, perhaps personal judicial view, if, there, if a case can succeed, the court should be part of a process to see that it is able to succeed. The court should not make it more hard. It's hard enough. And so we have the resource, we try to have the resources and the opportunities to give that case a chance, not only to discharge the debt, save that home, but frankly, to pay the creditors. Millions and millions and millions of dollars is paid to creditors every year in bankruptcy cases. So that's important too. But I wish it were easy. It's not, it's, it's sure not easy. Your second question concerned companies and kind of taking advantage of the system. And I'll say this, the system is pretty good at catching people, catching companies and imposing remedies on parties that come not in good faith. And that's the way we would say it. Um, for me, the assumption is that anyone who, who files a document or appears in our court is in good faith. But you can persuade me otherwise if you try hard enough. And the United States trustee, which is a different kind of trustee, it's the Justice Department of the United States, our Ministry of Justice, looks at every single case and represents, in effect, pub the public interest and um, the integrity of the system. And if something looks engineered, to take advantage of an opportunity, if debts were incurred with no intention to repay them, that's a fraud. And we don't, we don't like fraud. We have, there are consequences for fraud. Now, fraud has an intent element, it's hard to prove. But if you prove it, the consequences are significant. If you lie in your bankruptcy case or in connection with it, that's worse than a civil fraud, that's a crime. And our title is Title, Eight, is title 11 of the United States Code, but there's also Title 18. And there are bankruptcy crimes. Now, in 12 years and thousands of cases, I can think of one, in my caseload, and I may be missing something, and it was actually, I, I think I have this right, I was not involved with the prosecution, I believe a lawyer forged a court order. Well, that's forgery. It's, it's forgery by a professional. It's, it's, it's a terrible thing. But it is the rare case, frankly, in my experience, that bad faith or fraud are truly involved. And when they are, I mean, people go to prison. I did have one such case, a big corporate fraud and the bankruptcy that came after it. So the remedies are there. And the process is so transparent and so probing that the lack of good faith tends to be discovered. So, but it's a concern. Nobody wants to see the process abused. I sure don't. I, I have to say this in a measured way. Not in my courtroom <laughs> do I want to see a fraud committed. The process is too important to me. So, but we need all this to be mindful of. Thank you very much. I prefer in Spanish. Um, bueno, hemos estado eh, viendo durante las exposiciones que parece ser, bueno, pues ha habido una, una crisis económica que ha tenido pues, repercusiones a nivel nacional, a nivel europeo, pero quizá también, y yo es algo que, que igual echa en falta, 
parece ser y también se ha oído que lo que ha habido también ha sido una, una crisis de valores. Y hemos podido ver, yo creo, que, que lo mejor y lo peor del ser humano. Lo mejor es que pienso que ha habido también pues, mucho apoyo, mucha ayuda a familias, a ciudadanos, a personas que lo han pasado realmente. ¿Quieres acercarte ahí? Pero también comentaba, eh, hemos visto lo, lo mejor y lo peor. Lo peor, pues realmente ha habido leyes, se han aplicado, hay gente que ha perdido sus hogares y demás. Puestos de trabajo y por otro lado, con el concepto de lo que es la ciudad en sí, también vivimos en este siglo XXI esa parte más de Smart Cities, donde queremos eh, todos los países presumir de, de las mejores ciudades. Nos preocupamos porque sean sostenibles, eficientes, que ofrezcan una buena calidad de vida a las personas, que sean atractivas, al final que sean cool. Pero yo me pregunto, ¿qué tipo de valores en este siglo XXI debe de tener un país, deben de tener las personas que hacen las leyes. Esa es mi pregunta. Thanks. I am no more qualified to answer that question than any of you. Um, so we can pass the microphone around what values we bring to our life's work, to our families, to our communities, is intensely personal. I think there is a significant area of agreement, of common, we say common values. I guess in the, is it the 19th century, we said the social contract. Um, in our system, In our court system, in our justice system, we value respect, transparency, an opportunity to be heard, fairness. For myself, I would say decency. Um, sometimes I have to do very hard things, but I don't have to make them worse by how I do them. Um, I think the values reflected in, a, in an insolvency or restructuring system that comprehensively but appropriately offers a second chance are, are values I'm comfortable with and values that permit me in my professional life to act in a way that is consistent with how I hope I act in my personal life. Um, I think the more you learn about how these processes work in fact, my own view may be naive, but I hope not, is that you would agree that it is, on the one hand, difficult to permit someone to, bake, to break a promise to pay a bill, not to live up to their obligations, not to pay their rent or their taxes. If someone doesn't pay, someone else pays more. Um, but I think in those societies where by the laws, the society has indicated that there's a balancing that may be appropriate. Um, the result may be the kind of insolvency law that permits a second chance. Now, I'm not an economist, 
but I think an economist might say that that may be consistent with your values, but it's also consistent with value because it promotes entrepreneurship. It promotes starting a business. It promotes um, taking measured risk. Um, it may promote home ownership. It promotes things that are important. It promotes the constructive redeployment of assets in the economy through a liquidation, if that's what, if that's the path that makes sense in the particular circumstance. So for me, both value and values are appropriately effectuated in a restructuring, insolvency, liquidation, bankruptcy process. But I have to come back to where I began. I'm no ex I am no more expert on values than any of you. So I, I would pass the mic back and ask you how you would answer the same question. Uh, bueno, con el tiempo que nos queda, eh, quiero hacer dos cosas. Uno, dar una oportunidad a los alumnos de, de ELSA. Eh, de, han preparado un caso de estudio para llevar esa filosofía o valores, entre comillas, si se pueden decir, a, a nuestra tierra, con un caso eh, bueno, de más o menos esta región, eh, del, por lo menos del país español. Eh, Edu o de vuestros compañeros, si queréis compartir el caso y preguntar a, a la jueza cómo respondería a un caso europeo. Uh, good afternoon. I, I don't know. Uh, I don't know if you've read it, but I sent uh, sent you uh, the case of Bankia. Yeah, that's it. And I would like to to ask you what uh, what do you think that could have happened in the USA? if Bankia was an American bank, and, and whether if the, if the American government would have rescued the, the bank. So that both are my questions. Uh, the, first of all, thank you for coming. I so admire the work of Elsa, and I mean it when I say that I've had your colleagues in my courtroom and courthouse as my guests when they've come to New York as part of delegations at the United Nations. And I hereby invite you, each and all of you actually, to come and visit our courthouse, a beautiful building, a really interesting place. Um, the Caso Bankia case that is described in the in information that you've provided uh, and, and the situation, I think is, this is a real situation, I'll, I'll comment in a general way um, because it, it does permit me, it, it's, it's a great example and a great illustration of um, several things about restructuring systems, bankruptcy systems, insolvency systems, and some of the choices that are made in the U.S. system, of course, federal system. Um, that go to the who can be in a bankruptcy case and the where and the how and maybe a little bit the why. So these are the fundamental questions. Uh, in a general way, as you describe it, this was a situation where after a financial a period of financial distress, uh, there was a what some people call a good bank, bad bank, division of assets with support from the government, as I understand it. Um, Interestingly, in the United States, because of the regulation of banks, banks are not eligible to file a bankruptcy case. Banks are reorganized or restructured. Um, failed banks are taken over or a transaction is put together by the banking regulators. I think this may be, and there are, there are certain kinds of businesses, banks being very significant among them, that simply are not eligible to be a debtor under our bankruptcy law. If you go to chapter one 
where the definitions are. And by the way, there is no chapter 2, 4, 6, 8, 10. 12 is for farmers. There's no 14. I don't know why for 12 years. I don't know why we don't have even number chapters, but we don't. They're saving them, I guess. But eligibility to, be, we, to file a bankruptcy case is defined, and banks are not eligible. But banks can be restructured, saved, if you will, um, through the bank regulation process, through our FDIC, or Federal Deposit Insurance Corporation, the controller, the Fed, um, and they step in very promptly, as you know, as you may know, when a bank is in financial distress and they may close the bank on Friday and reopen it on Monday uh, following a transaction over the weekend. So to your first question, how would this have be, how would this proceed in a bankruptcy case? The answer is actually that because of the extent, the great extent of regulation and the deposit insurance provided through the FDIC that says that, for example, if we all have accounts there, we won't lose our money because our accounts are insured. That doesn't happen in our court. It doesn't happen under our law. It happens somewhere else. Now, it's not a dissimilar process, I think, but it doesn't happen in the bankruptcy world. The structure that's described, um, the what, so that's the who. What happened here? We're in effect, you segregate the better and the worst lines of business, the, the successful and the unsuccessful lines of business, that is a pattern you see all the time in a successful reorganization. Imagine, for example, a national retail chain. And this has happened a lot. It was some kinds of stores. Um, and they may have leases that are better and worse. They may have stores that are more and less successful. In a bankruptcy case, they can pick and choose, like good bank, bad bank. They can say, we have 100 stores around the country, 1,000 stores around the country. We'll keep these 700. We'll let those 300 go. And you know, in the bankruptcy process, we can reject those contracts, pay the appropriate rejection damages. We can move forward and reorganize good company, unprofitable company, focus on our profitable lines of business, address all of the obligations that generates under that big tent, remember, and, and confirm that all in a plan of reorganization where, remember the tide, everyone's going to be a little better off or the judge can't confirm it, not because she doesn't want to, but because that's a requirement of the bankruptcy law. Um, so that structure, segregating profitable and unprofitable assets, it's absolutely a routine um, potential tool in a restructuring case. Um, do I think the U.S. government would have stepped in to support a bank failing in this context? Well, um, the political branches of government make decisions in, informed by all of the factors that are weighed in that context. Um, in our system, banks, because of their role in the economy, because of their role in the payment system, um, are addressed through a pretty sophisticated um, system of regulation, which involves judgment. Um, not a judge's judgment, not a case. You probably won't be surprised to learn that my answer to the question, what would the U.S. government do, is your guess, maybe, your prediction is probably as valid as mine. I don't know. Um, I do know that that kind of consideration rarely, rarely enters in to a bankruptcy case. There have been some high-profile cases where the government at the level of the federal government has stated an interest or a position, and I can think of one in 12 years. Not my case. Um, but the answer is, I don't know. Do you, do you think they would or should? Uh, so I think we're about uh, at time. I uh, just want to leave you all with like one last reflection. Uh, 
I guess I can, voy a cambiar el, el castellano. Eh, una última reflexión inspirada en parte del, de la penúltima pregunta sobre los valores, inspirado también por una pregunta que veo en Facebook de, de Giuseppe Traverso. Eh, cuando estamos hablando de reestructurar o reorganizar una empresa o eh, situaciones, situaciones personales o hasta más eh, entidades soberanas, ¿cuánto tiene que ser una consideración eh, financiera y cuánto de la responsabilidad social. Eh, podemos ampliar eh, el ámbito de relevancia de valores cuando estamos reestructurando en eh, momentos de crisis cualquier tipo de sea persona o entidad. Eh, ¿Qué tipo de reflexión deberíamos añadir a esta fórmula? Eh, una reflexión. Eh, Podéis contestar en Twitter, en Facebook y por supuesto que Muchas gracias por estar. El próximo encuentro de Diálogos Europeos es el 27 de marzo. Viene un filósofo alemán. Ah, eh, oh, perdona, mayo. <risas> Mirando al futuro, no al pasado. El 27 de mayo, gracias. Eh, viene el filósofo alemán eh, Edgar Grande eh, para hablar de la politización, nuevas formas de gobernanza en Europa, eh, moderado por Daniel Inerariti. Eh, pues es que casco. Eh, buenas noches. Thank you to all. Thank you.